Hey guys, what's up? It's Jess. Welcome back to my basement here at Roots and Refuge Farm. Now there's actually kind of like freezing rain and yucky cold uh, winter going on outside. It's a cold January evening and I'm here in my toasty basement with a fire going and I've got my seed collection out. I've got seed catalogs. I've got a pen and paper. This is one of my favorite ways to spend a winter evening. Um, and today, from this place, I'm going to talk to you about my favorite tomato varieties. Uh, this is a video that's actually been requested quite a lot, and I've never made it. Now, I have made some videos harvesting tomatoes and kind of showing some different things. I'll put links to those down below if you are currently in the mood to binge some tomato growing goodness. But uh, I get asked a lot, what are your favorite varieties? And you guys really like to ask me the impossible question, if you could only grow one, which one would it be? And I don't, I don't know that I can honestly answer that. I did, however, sit down and go through my, uh, kind of my lists, my records from the last few years, um, and my tomato collection, my seed collection, the seeds that I've saved, as well as the catalogs from some of my favorite places, and just made sure I wasn't forgetting anything. And I have narrowed it down to a list of my top 10-ish, and I say ish because uh, some of these I've kind of grouped some together to tell you a few varieties that may be very similar. Um, now, with this, uh, I will tell you these are not the only varieties that I will continue to grow. However, everything that I mentioned today, I will always grow as long as I have a large garden. If I had to narrow it down to 10, um, th these would be the ones that I would narrow it down to. In years past, I have grown between 60 and 80 varieties of tomatoes um, every year, the last, the last handful of years that I've been really into growing them. I love to grow heirlooms and other open pollinated hybrids, um, ones that have been recently developed and have been established so that the seeds can be saved. And I still love trying new things. Um, whenever a new tomato seed comes out or I get sent something from a viewer, I love being able to make room for some new things in my garden. But since I have been gardening now for several years, I do have some tried and true favorites that I really love and I'm glad to tell you why. Now this list is not in any particular order because like I said, I really don't have a number one favorite. It's kind of like, what are your favorite pair of shoes? And they may be uh, your house shoes, but you obviously you wouldn't wear them on a night out or they may be your uh, favorite pair of heels, but you wouldn't wear them to go hiking. To me, tomatoes have such specific uses that I can tell you what my favorite slicer is or maybe what my favorite cherry is, but overall my favorite tomato, it would, it would be hard, but it would be one of the ones on this list depending on what the application was. I do get my seeds from multiple different places. Um, I'm going to put links down below to these tomato varieties from the places that I first originally got the seeds. I just felt like that would be a kind of easy way for you to be able to source these because the seeds that I originally got for these, even though they might be sold at multiple places, uh, there are a few different places that I bought them from. But I'll put links down below for that too. Uh, those, aren't, those aren't affiliate links or anything. I'll just uh, save you the trouble of having to Google it. Now before we start, I will also add that I do have a video about growing tomatoes if you're looking for more information on how to do that successfully. Also, we'll have the link down below to that. But uh, as for right now, let's go ahead and just jump right in to talking about these tomatoes. Okay, so number one that I wrote down on my list, um, and I'm gonna say this wrong, we all know this, I say it wrong, it's uh, Dr. Witchy's Yellow, and I've had, a, I've had multiple people tell me, oh, the correct way to say it is this, that, or the other, and I've had people adamantly tell me about five different pronunciations, but um, I think it may be actually Dr. Weish's, but anyway. Big yellow slicer. Um, I have had an incredible go with this tomato. I've always had good results. It was one of the first heirlooms that I actually grew years ago, and I really, really like it. I, it, it produces 
pretty consistently large tomatoes for me on average last year. Um, I was getting multiple 18 to 20 ounce fruits off of these plants. Um, they've been pretty heavy producers and I like them. They're really meaty. Yellow tomatoes are more mellow. They're not quite as acidic and um, they don't they don't have quite as much as that umami flavor. It's more like a sweeter flavor. I really love uh, yellow tomatoes for tomato sandwiches or BLTs. And Dr. Witchies is one that kind of has a special place in my heart because it was one of the first heirlooms that I ever grew. Um, it is very, very similar to Kellogg's Breakfast if you've ever heard of that tomato also. And so if you're like weighing out between the two of those um, I have found them to be very very similar I still grow both of them um, this year I tried to like compare the two but I really honestly didn't notice a whole lot of difference between the two how they grew how they produced, and how they tasted I think maybe Kellogg's breakfast is a maybe a slightly darker tomato but even that side by side it was hard for me to differentiate between the two okay number two Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson is a tomato that I grew for the first time a couple years ago and immediately fell in love. Now I had one experience in the garden and I've talked about this before. The flavor of your tomatoes is largely, largely dependent on how you're growing them. Um, if you pick a tomato right after the plant has been watered and that has had a chance to soak up that water and kind of dilute the sugars in that tomato, you're going to experience a less flavorful tomato than if you pick them say in the heat of the day uh, when all those sugars are concentrated and the plant may be a little or on the drier side. So when I say this, I want you to keep in mind that there were some circumstances that went into what I'm about to say. But the best tomato that I have ever tasted in my life was a Paul Robeson tomato and I picked it one afternoon. It was a hot afternoon. It was a smaller fruit that had grown on this plant and I just remember tasting it and like I literally sat down and just thought this is going to be over in, th in, in just a handful of bites and then I'll never have this exact tomato again and this is the best tomato I've ever tasted. It was so, so good. Paul Robeson is kind of a medium uh, size globe-ish kind of, I would say kind of slicer would be what it is, but not quite as meaty as some of the bigger ones that I'm talking about. Um, but it's like a dark purple, sort of dark greenish shoulders. And it has, it is very, very well known for being a very good flavored tomato, kind of more of the smoky, richer flavor. The next one is Italian heirloom. Now I came across this seed uh, from a company called Fruition Seeds. And they actually are more catered to northern growers and I was searching for a certain squash and I'd gone and bought the squash from them and I'd thrown the Italian heirloom in just because I'd not seen those seeds for sale anywhere else um, and grew it and was absolutely blown away by it. It produced so much wonderful big uh, meaty tomatoes. It's more of a paste type, which means it doesn't have a lot of seeds. It's just got a whole lot of flesh to it. Uh, but I, I overall just thought it was absolutely amazing. And it became my most favorite paste tomato to grow. It was just wonderful. Literally, I had multiple fruits that were two pounds almost. They made great salsa, great sauce because there weren't a whole lot of seeds. It was just really hearty. And the plants did really well. They produced a whole lot and earned a place, a forever place in my garden. Um, I also like to grow Amish paste. And if I had to compare the Italian heirloom to anything, I would compare it to the Amish paste. I've had some Amish pastes come out really big like that. Um, the thing that I like about both of those, the Italian heirloom and the Amish paste, is that they have good flavor. Sometimes when you're growing paste tomatoes, um, they're a little on the bland side or they tend to get grainy or gritty. And both of these, uh, Italian heirloom and Amish paste, paste, have a really thick flesh that stays uh, really smooth. So I still grow both of those. If you were coming down to it and you just couldn't decide between the two, know that they're very similar. But the Italian heirloom is fantastic. Okay, number four is climbing triple crop. To this day, the largest tomato that I have ever grown is the climbing triple crop. Um, this year, I had a climbing triple crop break 
my largest tomato record, which was also a climbing triple crop. So it just outdid itself this year. I will tell you that as far as flavor, um, it's a little more on the basic side. I've never had a wow, I need to sit down moment with a climbing triple crop tomato. It's just more basic, simple tomato flavor, which is what you would expect from a classic red tomato, which is not a bad thing. Um, obviously, it's very tasty, homegrown tomato. I've never been disappointed in the flavor, but it also, it doesn't have the wow factor of say like Paul Robeson. However, it does produce a lot. I have, um, I've had plants that have produced clusters of um, eight, maybe 16 to 20 ounce fruits at a time. So that's a, that's a lot. It's a very, very heavy producer. When I purchased the seed, um, I had done some research on it and done some searching and looked for people talking about it because it wasn't one I'd heard just a whole lot about. And um, I'd seen people say that it would vine 15 feet and it would produce multiple bushels. I've never had that kind of experience with it, but I'm also growing in Arkansas where we have a ton of heat and humidity. And so my tomato plants actually usually don't last like T until the frost. Usually they get taken out by sickness before then because of the humidity. So I'm, I'm not saying that it's impossible for it to grow that way, but just so that the expectations can, can be real. Um, here I've never had a 14 foot climbing triple crop that produced bushels, but I've never had any tomato actually do that. The tomatoes I've grown, climbing triple crop has produced very much, very large fruits that are, are really steady. It is a slicer, so um, it, it's one that has a lot of meat, still has a good bit of seeds. I use slicers for processing. Um, I think that they do okay. It's just gonna have a little more juice to pull off of them than maybe if you were just doing paste tomatoes. Okay, number five. Um, Black Beauty. Now this is a wild boar farms variety that was developed by Brad Gates. And the reason why I put Black Beauty on this list, now I think it tastes really good. It's a, um, it's less rich flavor, more light, uh, maybe a, kind of a fruitier flavor. Uh, the, it's the one that gets the, the black purple skin. Now the color, the anthocyanins in that skin are really gonna come out a lot more where the sun is hitting that fruit. So sometimes you're gonna have fruits that look way more pink that might have that black blush on the shoulders where the sun's hitting them. And then sometimes if you have fruits that are getting a lot of sunshine, they're gonna get a lot darker. Black Beauty is the wow factor tomato. It's the one that I put in because I think that there is a lot of value in growing things that interest you, that you're excited, that you feel committed to, and that you cannot purchase at the store. Um, actually, I probably give away over half of the Black Beauties that I get. I never process them. Um, you could, and I have, I shouldn't say never. I have processed them before, and you can, but to me, it's just such a shame to take the purple skin off that tomato and put it in a jar where it blends in with all the rest. Um, so for me personally, I like to eat those fresh and I love to give them away because I love to see the excitement of people who might not have gardening experience or um, have an opportunity to garden themselves because I'm certain that they've never held a black or purple tomato before. They've never had that unless they knew a gardener to give one to them. So I love Black Beauty. I will always grow it because it excites me and I like having something special. I do think it's also delicious. Um, and it, they've been pretty productive for me. Um, they're not quite as, as productive as maybe some of the ones that I'm talking about in my experience, but they're totally worth growing. Okay, number six is another wild boar farms. You're gonna hear me talk about these uh, wild boar farms a few more times, but large barred boar, and I also, I kind of put slash pink perkly tie-dye. Now these are, these are a different variety, but they are similar. The first time I ever ordered seeds from Baker Creek, actually, several years ago, um, I, I received some large barred boar seeds in that order and I grew them in a pot on my front porch. I, it was kind of one of the hooks that got me into growing unusual tomatoes. Now, large barred boar is more of a red tomato, red and green striped, whereas pink Berkeley tie-dye is more of a pink and green striped, but they are kind of, I guess, cousins, you could say. Um, both of these were bred by Brad Gates at Wild Boar Farms. And because pink tomatoes usually do have more of a 
a mild flavor or more of a fruity flavor, whereas red tomatoes are gonna have more of that depth and smoky flavor. You experience that with these. So there is a difference in these, but to me, they're related and I kind of clump them together. I usually plant them uh, near one another, but I like both of those. I think, again, they're gonna bring visual interest. While being good producers, I end up with a lot of both of these. Um, and the reason why I honestly listed both of them is because I usually do plant them together and I'll harvest them all at once. Sometimes I can't tell you which is which without really putting them side by side and looking at them and telling, oh wait, this one's darker than the other. Uh, they are quite similar and both really, really good producers. I would say they produce the same, they perform the same and I really, really like them. Now, number seven on this list is actually a total newcomer. Last year was the first year that I've grown it in my garden, but I knew with growing that that I always would. And that was a Thornburns terracotta. It was introduced at Baker Creek last year, I believe for the first year. And it is a really interesting tomato. Now I did have some variation in the sizes of mine. I had some that were like on the larger side, their slicers, some came in kind of small, but all of them were consistently this dark, dark uh, terracotta, orange and really fantastic flavor. They just had like a real richness to them. Um, when I, since I do so grow such a variety, I like having a variety of colors. And so when I'm making something like I'm making pico or I'm making uh, something that's going to have a mix, a salad or whatever, it's going to have a mix of different tomatoes in it. I would um, cut up lots of different pieces and I would put it all in something and I would be eating just not paying attention. And as soon as a bite of this would hit my mouth, I would know that that's what it was. It was just that rich in flavor. And I would stop and look at it and be like, oh yeah, there's that dark orange tomato again. So this year, I actually only grew one plant last year because I was just trying it as a new one. I'm going to do uh, a few, at least like maybe four or five plants this year and really give it a solid try and really see how I like it, how consistent it is, how it grows. Um, it kind of took me by surprise last year. I didn't give it very much space. I just had the one plant. I didn't pay that much attention to it until it started putting out these fruits. And I was like, whoa, I really like this. So I went ahead and put it on this list because I definitely, I think it's going to become a long time favorite, you know, once it's had more time to do that. Number eight is uh, Wild Boar Farms Berry Line. So this is where the ish comes in because I, uh, I didn't narrow this down. Uh, Wild Boar Farms has three um, cherry tomato varieties called blueberry, blue gold berry and blue cream berry. And um, or I think they're sometimes called blue boar berry, um, blue gold boar berry. And this is longstanding a favorite for me. Um, I, I've said this multiple times, you may have heard it before. The berry line is always the first tomato that comes ripe in my garden and the last that's still going. They stay really healthy. Um, I think this last year, another one of the wild boar farms might have beat it for the first by like a day, but it is a fantastic producer. At one point, one year I had, I think 17 or 18 cherry tomato plants that were on a long line of cattle panels. And on the end, there were four of the 17 or 18 that were blueberries and blue gold berries. Um, I think it was two of each. And I would come down and pick cherry tomatoes about every three days and I would pick around five pounds of cherry tomatoes every three days and half of that bucket would be from those four plants. Uh, they're just crazy prolific producers. Uh, do note that the cream and the gold do have thinner skins um, and that is kind of typical uh, from what I've seen of yellow or or cream colored cherries. Usually those thin, those skins are thinner. If you have a problem with eating cherry tomatoes because you don't like thick skinned cherry tomatoes, you might try these because they are very thin skin. Um, and you do see the flavor differences. The, blue, the blueberries that are the red ones with the purple shoulders are more acidic tasting. They're, you know, that richer, smokier flavor, definitely more punch to them. Whereas the blue gold and the blue cream are a sweeter cherry. They don't have quite that acidic kick. So these are very different. However, when it comes to being very prolific, uh, when it comes to being beautiful, they all have the same purple shoulders. Again, like the blue uh, 
like the black beauty that anthocyanins the darkness is going to come out more where the sun hits like if you have a branch fall over and a whole cluster that's um directly in the sun it'll turn completely purple but overall they produce fantastic i always make room for these they're totally worth it uh, they market well being so beautiful and everybody who comes to my garden really really likes these now number nine is also a wild boar farm variety which is called napa chardonnay blush um, I grew the rosé this year, which is the pink version of this, and it was good. It was a good, it was a good pink cherry tomato, but it didn't quite wow me like the Chardonnay blush. Um, the Chardonnay is one that I absolutely adore. It's the one who that beat out for the first producer this last year, just by a day or two, it beat the berry line. It's the first time the berry line has not been the first in my garden. Uh, Chardonnay blush has kind of, it's, a, it's like a really light yellow cream colored cherry tomato. It gets a little bit of that anthocyanin blush. Sometimes the stems kind of turn purple and occasionally you'll get just a little bit of purpling, a little bit of that uh, shading on the tomato itself. But it's very mild, very sweet. Now they are thin skinned, so again, and like if you're gonna have a rain, but basically what you do, if you if you know you're growing a variety that has thin skin, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people really prefer it, but they're gonna crack easier than others. And so if it's gonna rain, uh, you basically need to get out there and pick them or just make sure that you're watering them really evenly. Uh, cracking comes from uneven watering and you get that whenever you're letting your plants get way too dry and then dousing them with water or they're getting a heavy rainfall. So even watering is the way to overcome that and I don't disqualify a tomato because it cracks. I prefer that these have thinner skin. I actually like that about them. And then I just know that I need to manage them a little bit more intently than something that might be resistant. Uh, Cause I, I, if a tomato is crack resistant, but it's skin is so thick that it's not enjoyable to eat, that's not a benefit to me. Napa Chardonnay blush, these plants get huge. Um, I have a, about six to seven feet of support with the way I do my cattle panels with the space underneath. And these tower above them every year. They probably, I think last year they probably got close to 10 feet. It's probably the tallest tomato plant I've ever had. And they just produce and produce and produce. Um, very tasty. I really, really like this cherry. Uh, the last number 10, the one that I've put on here is, uh, the bumblebee line. And there's sunrise bumblebee, purple bumblebee, and I think that there's a pink bumblebee, but I actually haven't grown that one. I've just done, or if I have, I don't remember it. Like it was pretty like, I mean, it wasn't memorable to me, but I know the sunrise and the purple I really like they're bigger they're not like a tiny cherry tomato they're more like a one ounce globe uh, sort of maybe flirting with being considered a saladette but i would still lump it in the cherry category because they're still you could eat it in one bite um they're really really beautiful really tasty cherry tomatoes to me for the most part I like most of them. Um, occasionally I'll grow one that has like a really, really thick skin or it grows like a really weird size or the plant just does poorly consistently over a couple years and I'll go ahead and nix it off my list. But that's rare. I've only actually ever like sworn off of a few cherry tomatoes. For the most part, they're all pretty much the same. I've tried a lot of different like red cherries. I'm thinking like the Chadwick cherry and Tommy Toe and Sweet 100s and like a lot of different varieties. Um, I'm thinking Isis Candy is one and they're all, they're good. Um, I, they don't leave me like amazed. They're definitely better than a lot of what you buy in the store, but there's nothing about them that really sets them apart. And so when I talk about like the bumblebee, now the first two, the Wild Boar Farms, Berry Line and the Chardonnay Blush, those are like wow tomatoes to me. Like they're, those are ones that just because of their production and their flavor, I really, really like. The bumblebee line is honestly set apart to me simply because of how beautiful it is. It's very prolific, it's beautiful, the plants stay pretty healthy in my experience. As far as flavor, I mean it's really good but a lot of other cherry tomatoes are really good and so this one's set apart 
based on the beauty. My, one of my favorite things about the summer garden is the fact that at any given point during the summer, if you come in my house, there is a bowl of a mix of 19 different kinds of cherry tomatoes sitting on my counter. My kids eat them like candy. Everybody who comes over and visits, we just stand there and eat cherry tomatoes. It is the snack of the summer and I love having a variety. And Sunrise Bumblebee and the Purple Bumblebee, I've not found anything else quite like them as far as how they look. So, and that's really why they made my Always Grow list. Now, I have a couple of honorable mentions. I really wanted to give you my top 10 that I would suggest that you grow if you're growing on more limited space. Uh, because I want you to have something that I feel pretty confident is going to be a good experience for you. I know some of you are growing and you're having to pick a couple of tomato varieties. And so that's why I'm telling you these as here are my overall favorites. Uh, very close and very nearly made this list was Aunt Ruby's German Green. <clears throat> Aunt Ruby's German Green is a green tomato, so it ripens green. Now, some people think that you, like, you've heard of fried green tomatoes, which is a southern thing, and also there's a movie by the same name. Um, f when you fry green tomatoes, you're actually frying unripe tomatoes. So you could fry any color tomato before it starts to turn colors and ripen. Um, green tomatoes that you grow to have green tomatoes, this, these ripen green. So they actually look really light green, and then when they start to ripen, they get darker. And the, the way you know how to pick them when they're ready is by just giving them a little squeeze and once they start to soften up and feel like a ripe tomato that's when you know they are. Um, some of them are just okay to me. There's just nothing very special about them whenever I'm eating them. They're just they're just okay. I really I like a good green tomato though again for the beauty the visual aspect the fact that you don't really just go buy them at the store. Um, and Aunt Ruby's German Green is very good. I, f I feel like it's very sweet. Um, the plant grows really well. It produces quite a lot. It is unusual. It's not something that you get a lot of. And uh, you can use it just like anything else. You can can it if you want to make like a green salsa. You could do that with this. Um, and it's just really good. So I, I like Aunt Ruby's German Green. And so really, it's like, in, it's in my top 11. <laughs> Um, and the next one that I really wanted to mention because I talked so much about it last year was Wild Boar Farms Painted Lady. Um, Brad just released that tomato last year. I was so pumped about it because it's variegated. The leaves are variegated. The tomato is really streaky. Um, it's kind of got a point on the end, sort of like a sweetheart shape. Um, and I was so excited about it because it was a variegated tomato. When I found out he was doing it, I found out at the expo the year before he had some samples out and I was, I was just so thrilled. So I was so tickled by it. And I grew it. I talked all about it all spring and then it grew and I didn't talk about it quite as much. I'm still planning on growing it. Now the variegation fades in the sunshine. So obviously you're planting your tomatoes in full sun. So you're going to lose a lot of that variegation once you plant it out. At starts, there was a lot of it because they were in the greenhouse. But once we moved them out, I did lose some of the variegation. Um, the fruit size is more like a salad size, which is like a two ounce kind of thing. Um, and it was so sweet that it honestly just tasted like fruit to me. Um, it did not have any sort of acidic bite. I really, really liked it. I don't grow a lot of that size. I like to grow slicers because I can eat them fresh or I can can them. Um, and I don't do that much with that two ounce, two, three ounce size. However, I still really did like that. And I knew some people would say, hey, you were so excited about that last year. Um, would I say it's a top 10 for me? No, um, but just because it lacks the versatility because of the fruit size. However, the flavor's fantastic. If you've got room to grow it, I think it's a really good one to grow. There are a lot of other fantastic tomatoes. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, and thankfully, I don't have to just grow 10-ish. Um, I will probably still grow dozens and dozens and dozens of varieties. However, uh, whereas I might try one of, of a new one, or I might just grow one of one that I just kind of like, these are the ones that I will put multiple plants in my garden and if I did have to downsize, uh, these would be the ones that would definitely have a space. 
So I hope this helps you. If you have a favorite uh, must grow tomato, please uh, let me know because I'm still making my list of what I'm gonna try this year and I would love to have your recommendations. And if you have any questions, also please put them down below. I will have all the links for you to check out uh, these for your seed shopping purposes. And I thank you for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.